All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here um, and, and actually kind of get into everything uh, now. So as I mentioned before to the same audience, uh, I, I don't think anyone else joined. This is just a introduction to the world of automotive cybersecurity, which defines typically hacking anything that is um, vehicles. Uh, this can be trucks, uh, cars, or um, e even something from what I've seen. I mean, I saw someone hack a crane which was interesting, but uh, yeah, pretty much just anything in the automotive sector is what this presentation is about towards the cybersecurity research. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and get into it here. Um, I know I think, yeah, okay, presentation's a bit weird. Um, so first thing I'd like to go over is why would you want to attend this kind of presentation or presentations like, or even demonstrations? I've listed four points here. Um, they're all pretty visible, but I, the main reason why I decided to create this presentation personally, uh, and I'm going to go kind of off topic of the points, is because I feel like that there is a very, very, very small amount of education in the automotive cybersecurity space. Um, so presenting and bringing awareness to at least what the field is and what the field entails is pretty important uh, in my eyes. And through that, we can actually help people understand, you know, why it's so important, why there should be more research, and why research just in general should be important. With that being said, we can actually go straight from there and go into what we're going to talk about today. Because this is an introduction, I have kept this very small. Um, I'll be going into a few points, like subpoints, that I really didn't list here. Um, but all of these are slides. The first thing I always like to do with any form of presentation is kind of give you a who am I background, even though most of you guys here already understand who I am. For the people who are probably going to be watching this on the recording side of things, uh, that's what this section is for. Uh, the end goal of this presentation is similar to why attend. We'll go over to a few points there. And then we'll go into the whole what, why, and how. Um, so the what is automotive cybersecurity research? Why is it important? and how automobiles network. Networking is something that you see in cybersecurity presentations, but you don't really see it in, in introduction. The reason I chose to introduce as to why how automobiles network and stuff is because I think it's important for some of the topics that we're gonna be talking about here, uh, understanding serial communications and stuff, which we'll get into later. I then wanted to go over common attacks and attack surfaces for vehicles, which talk to you about modern and even vehicles back then in like 2019, 90s, and e even going far back as the 80s. Uh, why an attacker might target an automobile, like what's the motive, what's the reason, um, why is it, again, kind of tracing back into important, why is it important that we kind of have, as cybersecurity researchers, a target towards automobiles. How hackers can also practice this kind of sport. Uh, this is pretty important for people understanding, you know, how uh, we can get into it, how we can practice what we're hacking and so on from there. Then I kind of like explaining the web systems uh, and stuff like that in automobiles, which is in modern vehicles. Then we'll hop to threat modeling and then kind of end the presentation on a few other notes. With that being said, we can get into it. So this slide it shows a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of images, but uh, the basic, as mentioned, is just who am I? For those who don't know, my name is uh, Ryan, uh, also known totally not a hackster. I am a 16-year-old cybersecurity researcher and author of uh, a single book that's currently out. I have multiple in the uh, making right, right now that are going to be pushed out here soon. Um, currently, I am actually in the process of working with a cybersecurity research company that focuses on automotive cybersecurity called Block Harbor. Uh, they're one of the better cybersecurity research groups for the automotive sector. And I kind of primarily gain my experience from programming and theory, but have a wide, like really, really extremely tailored programming experience in the cybersecurity world, which basically means that I'm tooling and development where I'm making frameworks for cybersecurity purposes. I'm writing exploits or as of course my older path was, I was a game hacker. So I was making exploits for games. Uh, that being said, these uh, images are just kind of a, a good range of some of the stuff I've done just to give you a good brief overview of, you know, here's who I am. So now, Moving forward, if my presentation would like to go forward. Hello, wake up. Apple, there we go. Um, I guess it's just images are being weird. Yeah, 
Yep, see, I knew that shit was going to happen. <laughs> uh, okay. So this slide was supposed to be on what is automotive cybersecurity research. So if you guys are not familiar, uh, just cybersecurity research as a whole is just the security research of systems. In this case, it's the security research of systems in vehicles, um, primarily uh, the networks or the communications, really whatever it is. Kind of entails a lot of things. Uh, modern day vehicles require a lot of networking, a lot of data flow, a lot of external access and communications. They have all these unique modules that need to tie together. So pretty much just automotive cybersecurity research entails the research of those parts of the vehicle. Uh, we will get into more about those specific parts a bit later, especially when we touch the networking section of things. But this kind of can even go from anything from Wi-Fi to the most extreme parts where it's the chipsets and it's the actual hardware um, of the vehicle itself. Because even though it doesn't seem like it, most vehicles today are all drive-by wire technologies, um, or sorry, by wire technologies, where everything is done by a hardware board or some form of computer, uh, just for basic terms. Why is it important? Um, this is actually a very fun question I like. Uh, so in the background, I have an image of a guy who clearly looks like he drove his car into a ditch. But this was actually from the most notorious hack that was called the 2014 Jeep hack, where two cybersecurity researchers were able to break into a, a Jeep system remotely by attacking, I believe it was the telematic system or the infotainment console. I will have to lead uh, a link onto that story. Uh, but regardless, the point was that they were able to get uh, complete control over the vehicle's driving functionalities, braking functionalities, and uh, other functionalities that could lead them to self-driving the car remotely without actually self-driving it um, by like using, you know, your standard technologies like controllers or stuff, kind of like how Teslas are. <laughs> so this uh, importance here is to basically show people that kind of like how deadly it is if a terrorist is going to get in hands with it. Normally, when we do protect systems and we do cybersecurity research, we go ahead and say, okay, you know, we're just like protecting a small amount of data. We're protecting someone's identity. Or in the case of Google, you're protecting the, the, the world uh, from geo data and um, maybe even something as much as like social security numbers or whatever, whatever information that uh, Google may have on their own employees or people that use their platforms. Uh, in the case of automotive cybersecurity research, you're not actually researching for that reason. Um, you will do general research and you will find informational leaks, but a lot of what everyone is trying to target is show people how deadly this can be. Uh, in the case of the Jeep hack, where uh, they were able to remotely control the vehicle just by breaking into the system, uh, that can be dangerous for a few reasons. Uh, I'm going to tie this into another story. There is another story where researchers were able to break a remote API and brute force vehicle identification numbers, also known as VINs, and remotely control those vehicles as well. Uh, they could cut the engine, they could slam on the brakes, they could do whatever they wanted to by breaking the authentication of those APIs. Uh, imagine if a terrorist got to that and someone who really wanted to cause damage. Uh, I would say that it could either lead to extreme accidents or death in some cases, kind of in the same way how, you know, hacking drones, someone could fly it into a building or something if they really wanted to. That's a bit more of an extreme case, and I won't go deep into that side of cybersecurity. But this is just why it's important, primarily for saving human lives. And you want to protect people in vehicles, especially given that we're transitioning into this world of like self-driving technologies. And we're progressing so fast where we don't actually want to put the full effort in to protect specific systems, despite there being standards. I won't spend too much time on the slides because I've already spent a decent amount of time explaining. So I'll go ahead and go to our next one. This section is going to be the communication aspect, just literally just diving straight into it. So this section shows two primary protocols that I have listed. Um, two, one of them, which you guys might actually be familiar with if any of you guys have owned a vehicle or at least been in a very specific spot where some like mechanic has talked to you. So before I go into this, I'd like to explain that automotive communications are pretty important to understand on the aspect of understanding how modern day cars are built. Actually, even cars dating back to like the uh, 90s were built. Uh, for a brief breakdown of how automotive communications work without going into the protocols, each vehicle in today's world typically contains an electrical control unit, also known as an ECU. These ECUs need to be tied together because they need to send data fast over the network. They need to have some way of transferring data to your diagnostics system, like your, uh, how do I say it, the instrument cluster 
on your vehicle, or maybe they even need to read specific data from systems like airbag systems or tire pressure monitoring systems or something out of the whack there. They couldn't really do that with standard protocols. Um, of course, now we have an ethernet in cars and I'll get to that later at the end of this slide, but uh, primarily there are two types of communications that you'll see frequently, which are known as control area network and flex ray. Uh, control area network is the one on the left, it's CAN. And this has a whole history timeline, which I think you guys can get a pretty good example of, but I'll summarize it. The control area network protocol is a serial communications protocol that was developed for uh, automotive systems uh, primarily, but also was developed for other reasons. Uh, the reason it was developed outside of just being uh, assistive in automotive technologies was because back then cars had this like point to point structure uh, in their modules. They were all hardwired together. And the issue with that is that it requires a ton and ton and ton of copper, which of course cuts manufacturing prices or doesn't cut it, it actually raises them. Uh, mixed with the way cars were built back then, now you have a whole bunch of issues on top of pricing and trying to manufacture and mass produce cars. Not to mention, vehicles also needed to be taken to mechanics, and those mechanics would have a very hard time getting data from the modules that they needed. So someone needed to come up with some idea to not only cut manufacturing prices, but also make systems and networks and vehicles much more reliable. Uh, and this was actually developed at a German engineering uh, business uh, called BOSCH or Bosch, uh, Robert Bosch, forgot the full name of it um, because I think they had like a German tone to it. Uh, but you will also find that if you just search up Robert Bosch Engineering. And they were the ones to first actually develop and start the project in 1983. So pretty, pretty early on, but it didn't have its first demonstration until roughly like 1991, where the Mercedes was one of the first vehicles to have it in it. The protocol here, Control Area Network, actually saved more than just uh, standard cutting prices, but it also allowed us to make much more advanced systems, and it made mechanics a lot more, uh, how do I say it, a lot more faster in their works, especially given that there were specific diagnostics modules that were easier to reach, considering that they all used the network, and you could just slap a tool in there and just <laughs> grab all the data. Of course, there was more back then, but there was a lot more unique structure to it. Yeah. Uh, Fro made a point that it was much more efficient. It was very, very, very more, uh, much more efficient than the standard way they had it of point to point connecting. Now, on the other hand, I also would like to mention that control area network again was cheap. It was a very, very cheap but reliable protocol. Uh, and that's why it's still, still used in vehicles and you see it pretty much everywhere. On the other hand, you have protocols like FlexRay, which are much more expensive but there's a reason behind this. This project was started in the year 1999 to 2000. It was actually a joint project be behind multiple companies, being BMW, Diamore, GM, or General Motors, and Volkswagen. I believe Audi had also um, uh, had a primary state, or I guess that uh, take in this project as well. Uh, I forgot the brands. There's a few other brands that you can look up that have this project. They wanted a protocol that was going to adapt more to modern times. They wanted something that was fast, complex, really synced, really well stated and secure, per se. And the FlexRay protocol did just that. But instead, it actually became a bigger issue because it was very, very expensive. Uh, this protocol, due to its complexity, is still, I mean, it's still used today, but there is a huge issue with the factor that it's just complex. And uh, automotive manufacturers do not like complex, especially when getting a specific tools and enterprise frameworks to even load the data can be very, very expensive. Uh, and when I mean load the data, I mean actually find data through the network or diagnose the network as a whole. FlexRay is a very much more stronger protocol, again, and it's actually very well structured. It's pretty important, I would say, and you still use it and see it in today's vehicles like Audis, uh, for example, to name a specific model. The Audi A5 is a good example of a vehicle that still uses this protocol. I like to throw in this. So when it comes to automotive communications, I like to say that there is kind of like a Goldilocks principle in this industry. Uh, and, and again, I'll get to this later, but there is a reason that Ethernet took so long to get into the automotive industry. It's because it kind of barely touches that line. This Goldilocks principle is kind of the state that says, well, we need a protocol that's fast and reliable, but it can't be too fast and can't be too reliable. Not to mention, we need a protocol that is also very, very, very well structured, but not so, how do I say it? Um, not so expensive. Um, so 
CAN, on the other hand, is a really great protocol, but there was another protocol later called CAN-FD, which was more to like a more advanced version of CAN that kind of hit that Goldilocks principle. On the other side, you have FlexRay, which is on the other side of the extreme, and it's too good. Uh, same thing, again, following that Goldilocks principle. Uh, that is not really a direct standard that I've heard people use. I just technically use it to say that, okay, hey, control area network is a good protocol. It's a well-used protocol and very common, but at the same time, it's kind of becoming outdated. In modern day vehicles, you actually have uh, like a Tesla, for example, we have a protocol called automotive ethernet, which is just the ethernet version uh, tailored towards automotive tasks. The issue with this is that the factor that, you know, it's, Everyone knows what Ethernet is, so it's much more easier to hijack. And again, I'll get more into that later. Uh, but that pretty much sums it up for the automotive communication side of things. Pretty, pretty easy, pretty simple. But the key factor to take away here is that every single car today, every vehicle has to use some form of communication at the end of their staining to actually make sure everything goes as planned. I also have another slide. This slide, we're going to actually get into the modern day attack surfaces of vehicles. And hopefully, I think it should load right now. Yeah, if it wasn't so slow, I would have liked to fix that. So I've listed some pretty good key points here. Uh, one of the primary things are, you're going to see is a network and vehicles, the, the physical networks, the stuff we literally just went over. <laughs> um, so the thing with modern day vehicles is kind of changing in comparison to old vehicles that use protocols. So in the mid 2000s, when controller area network and control area network fast data rate, which was um, FD, CAN FD, and protocols like FlexRay came out, the access to those ports were very easy. You know, most people have, uh, I guess if you look at any vehicle, uh, you should see an OBD2 port uh, if that vehicle uses controller area network protocols. OBD2 is a very, very familiar port that is an onboard diagnostics port. It's basically so mechanics or anyone really can get diagnostics on the vehicle directly. Uh, that is powered by controller area network protocols and various other protocols. The issue with these is they become later on a problem. They became quite the attack surface for people understanding how to reverse engineer the networks and admit they could inject specific signals into the network, like steering commands or something like that. There was even a case study done by Common AI, uh, one of their um, teams, research teams, where they were able to basically intercept FlexRay on a Audi Q8 and inject controller area network commands into the FlexRay network, which was interesting. I'll drop that at the end. Um, but it's not really much of an attack surface because it's really, really hard to exploit it and it takes a lot and a lot of time just to attack a physical network. So. That's kind of something that you don't see much other than a demonstration and introduction to how cars work and how we can reverse engineer them and so on from there. Electrical control units, I kind of already tied this in with the fact of physical networks, but the ECUs all have their own systems, run on their own networks and are not own networks, but are tied to other networks and stuff in the vehicle. So they may be a bit more easier to target. Physical layers such as USBs, you guys may know that, like the USB charging ports and other systems and vehicles that exist that you can plug some malware into or it just be a common entry point to extract data or whatever it may be. Gas and charging systems are, oddly enough, a very overlooked one because charging systems are, uh, in the case of a Tesla, they're not really so secure and they're tied to the network in a very, very weird way. And if someone can get access to, say, a system that manages or gets diagnostics data, then they could probably see that as a plausible uh, direct, how do I say it, uh, entry point in the vehicle. The other two on the far left I have, these are kind of tie in together. The third party applications, key fobs, feature management, user management, and even uh, Wi-Fi networks and Bluetooth networks. All of these are valid entry points and actually a massive attack surface. Um, because remember, I tried to explain that when you want to attack a vehicle, you want to get the whole remote access of it. Uh, physical parts of the vehicle are targetable and they're worth it, but they're not as worth it as something like a remote hack maybe. Because you want to hack a vehicle, you want to show someone, hey, I don't need to be inside of your vehicle to take control of it. I can do this remotely and I can slam the uh, gas or cut the engine or do whatever. That being said, that kind of sums up some modern attack surfaces of vehicles. There's a lot more different attack surfaces, but these were just some primary points that I listed for general vehicles in today. But also keep in mind that even vehicles in the mid 2000s, even going further back, and you're saying like the year 2000 when control area network was used and other ports were used, 
there were still other attack surfaces that could be manipulated. To go into that, now we have another question. Why would some hacker target a car? He has a car, and then now he wants to attack it. What's the motive for attacks? I've listed two direct teams. You're kind of... Um, good team and then your bad team the red and blue i mean you know cybersecurity states that you know red and blue is uh you have your defensive and then you have your offensive and different teams and stuff like that but for this case of the presentation and in this context i'd like to define them as um the red being the negative person and then the blue being the positive you know the cyber security researcher there's many reasons as to why someone would want to target a vehicle uh, maybe they want to modify it maybe they don't like the fact that there is a governor on their vehicle and they want to maybe electronically disable it or something out of the random just modify the vehicle that would be an example of a a good um a, a good researcher uh, of course in a sense that can also be considered bad but for this one i'm going to consider it good because you're just modifying your own vehicle rather than trying to attack someone else but on the same subject of good there's a lot of reasons why someone might want to a target a vehicle, especially a test vehicle, for good reasons. Uh, maybe you want to do some scientific research. Maybe you want to actually educate people. And in the case of kind of what I'm trying to do here is, is like show how negative it, or how horrible it can be actually if someone gains remote access to a vehicle. And just even publishing that research is really, really important. On the other side, you have people that actually want to like kill or do damage with it. Thankfully, thankfully, there have been no real cases where people have been actually killed um, by a car hack, which is all thankful uh, to the researchers that were able to find vulnerabilities before terrorists was. Uh, but the whole reason why someone may want to attack a vehicle outside of the terrorization is just like, okay, kill, 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 is going to be remote theft and maybe even data theft. Maybe they need something inside of that vehicle that maybe no other vehicle has, uh, or maybe they just want to take the car remotely and then sell it off on the black market or whatever it may be. And that's just kind of a generalization um, of why they would. Not to mention, cars are actually, in today's world, they're a lot more easier to attack. Of course, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot more than just, okay, hitting um, a end map scan on the network and then finding some service to exploit. It actually takes sometimes physical access, some dissection of the vehicle, and it takes a whole different realm of things. Um, Fopon, who is a researcher in the server here or bug bounty uh, guy, he pointed out that even some people do hack cars easily where they just target the APIs. And that's actually something I want to bring up later. But sometimes it can be easy and sometimes it can be hard. You have people that are just attacking APIs and infotainment systems. And then you have people like at Block Harbor that are still doing that, but are also trying to target maybe some more sophisticated parts. Maybe they're trying to inject the hardware with fault, like fault injection attacks on the hardware, or do something to actually be a bit more deeper into the research realm. Regardless, uh, automotive security just in general encompasses all that. And sadly, it's uh, pretty easy to attack in today's world. Um, right. So... We actually go into our, our whole like good guy and bad guy again of why they're trying to target a vehicle, but how they can actually target. Why are they um, going to practice, but how are they going to practice legally? Something that I find totally missed here is a factor that uh, some people really don't know how to like get started in automotive cybersecurity. I mean, obviously, no one can just drop 80 grand on an Audi and, <laughs> and go haywire on enterprise frameworks and tools. It takes a lot of sponsors and a lot of work. However, there are places like where people like me started, uh, like virtualizations uh, and a whole bunch of other things without a vehicle. Uh, eventually, you will have to move to a physical vehicle. But again, that is way later down the line. I'm not even at that stage yet. <laughs> um, soon to be, though. But anyway, I have dissected this into actually two major points where I am saying uh, the physical and the virtual aspect. When it comes to the virtual aspect, I'm both attackers are going to want to target the same thing. They're going to want to do it for research, no matter their motive, the way they're going to practice, the way they're going to target really is not always going to be um, different. It may be the same. And in this case, I've listed some decent like examples of some virtual aspects, like network simulators. For example, if you go to GitHub and you type in ICSIM, which stands for Instrument Cluster Simulation, is a simulator developed by Zombie Craig. Uh, he's a uh, Craig Smith is his name. He was the author of the, I think it was called the Car Hacker's Handbook. 
And in that simulator, it kind of teaches you how to reverse engineer the controller area network protocol and inject commands into the network. That is a good example of a virtual simulator, a network simulator. Uh, sadly, CAN is one of the only protocols other than automotive ethernet, I believe. And I think there's like two other protocols you can mock on a system uh, where protocols like FlexFerry are very, very close source and their implementation varies depending on the manufacturer. Not to mention, I believe it is well over a few hundred dollars to even purchase an implementation of the protocol. Um, I, again, I don't have the industry knowledge on that, so I can't say fully of what it is, what pricing so on, but I do know that it's very hard to mock. The next thing is going to be understanding reversing tools and different protocols like CAN. Like CAN, I consider an open protocol because it's it's so known about and it's so well spoken about that it's just it's easy to understand. Uh, you can simulate specific network environments. You can simulate Bluetooth environments. And even in the case of Block Harbor, which again, I'll get to this at the end, they have a whole CTF and like box range that you can do. Uh, inside of, I believe, um, a connected vehicle uh, that they have set up. You can also go into the physical side of things where you're actually looking for uh, specific chipsets or maybe like manufacturer specific chips or looking at physical analyzers, uh, signal injecting, and a whole bunch of other things. I have a point listed here called chemical stations. This is something I always love bringing up. On the case of hardware hacking, you have standard fault injection which primary serves as a purpose to inject faults into a hardware. However, there is also another state called invasive fault injection. Invasive fault injection is a much more interesting attack. Uh, it's basically a way of injecting hardware in a sense where you're reverse engineering it with chemicals and different analyzers and systems like that. It's pretty much reverse engineering taken to a whole chemistry level, if you want to put it that way. Uh, some people go this far. It's very, very rare. I've only seen invasive fault injection on hardware used and talked about approximately once at a university in like the mid 2000s. But it was very interesting where they were able to take chemicals like acetone and basically melt parts or like protection mechanisms um, or layers on the board. Sorry, not mechanisms, but protection layers on the board to further dissect and understand the chip or the board that they were trying to reverse engineer. Uh, this can lead to a very interesting side of research where you're going way, way deeper. And at that point, you're not just tackling some Wi-Fi system or something like that. You're actually going much more deeper into the vehicle's internal to maybe understand maybe a specific module that they're using. Or if it's a proprietary uh, module that may help you understand what the vehicle's underlying structure may be. Uh, in general, uh, you can also hop into the signal side of things where you're talking about like uh, intercepting specific signals that are sent from the vehicle. Uh, for example, you guys are probably all familiar here with the Flipper Zero. God, I that tool annoys me because I see a lot of people popping Tesla charge ports. I, I won't go into the technical reasons as to how that works uh, just because I'm really just like bored um, of it. And plus, it's a weird thing to get into. Uh, but regardless, that is an example of a signal interceptor, something that can intercept or record signals, which may also be known as a software-defined radio, which like your hack RF one is an SDR. You can record signals and intercept signals. You can also inject signals into um, that network back on a physical level. Again, specific things and topics that go into it, uh, but just an example on general communication side of things. You also have your whole wireless decoders. This is a weird thing for me because, I mean, wireless decoding does and doesn't exist. Um, I mean, it does exist, obviously, but in the automotive world, I haven't yet to see it and I haven't heard much people talk about it, but it is something to look into if you're looking for specific wireless protocols or maybe even something that's manipulated a bit more. The next thing is uh, we already talked about SDRs, but sniffing utilities is a pretty big thing. Uh, if you want to sniff a network or at least understand, you know, what a network is sending, APIs and so on from there, then you would use something like Wireshark or actually in the case of automotive protocols, you use other frameworks to sniff those networks. For example, Wireshark absolutely sucks at sniffing controller area network protocols. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world, but you would be better off using other utilities because Wireshark is not the best for serial communications. I didn't define this, but just to get it off the chest here, serial communications are basically communication networks um, or protocols, sorry, uh, that use two different lines to send data. Uh, for example, uh, controller area network is considered serial communication because it uses two different lines to send data. I could get into that, um, but I really didn't have that laid out for this presentation uh, on the networking side. And plus that would take a whole individual uh, dissection of OBD2 ports and uh, different mechanisms and systems and so on from there to get into. 
but it is something I suggest that you guys look into if you guys get into the automotive networking aspect. Right. Finally, we can actually reach this section of things where we talk about the web. So back then in vehicles, there weren't that many systems. You had your standard radio, you had a few diagnostics modules, but you never had everything tied together today uh, or like it is today. Now we have everything. I mean, I mean, just look at the image in the background and you can see on the steering wheel that there is a bunch of buttons all the way around here that are showing, you know, answer call, fast forward music, uh, again, more call, deny, stars, dialing, even on the dash, uh, or not the dash, the, um, sorry, instrument cluster, you can see all of this information just here for the vehicle. Sometimes vehicles can't do all that on their network. They need assistance. Uh, maybe even some automotive manufacturers might not be using their own systems. They might need to use a third-party system that may be relying on another third-party system. Uh, and all these systems, they need some way to gather real-time information. Maybe they need to update software over the air. Uh, maybe they need to externally communicate with a weather server or something like that. Regardless, this is all going to be where web kind of touches cars. Not sure if you guys have heard Martian speak in the server, but he kind of likes to say that web is the future. I would not lie um, and tell you that that is false because <laughs> it is not. Web is definitely the future. Take a Tesla, for instance. A Tesla uses automotive Ethernet, and literally all it takes is for you to take an Ethernet cable from your laptop to your uh, vehicle and just plug it into the Ethernet port, and you can see all of the web traffic that happens on that vehicle. And it is, it is insane and mind-blowing how much stuff is truly left up to the web on vehicles, um, especially in today's world. And plus, it takes a massive load off of networks. Uh, automotive networks should be primarily used for safety systems, like safety critical systems. Um, airbags, for example, is where an automotive, uh, um, yeah, automotive protocol and network would really come in handy because you need it to prioritize data on the network, not have a bunch of junk data just flowing through it. And plus, automotive networks are very, very important for uh, those systems that need heavy data sent to them back and forth in a very fast rate. So I've listed a few reasons as to where um, where web kind of collides with vehicles and why they're used, uh, despite them being very, very insecure and, and a massive, massive attack uh, surface for hackers to get into when it comes to vehicles. The first being it's much more easier to you know build into it. It's much more performant, allows for all this unique development, and plus APIs, for example, because uh, this is kind of what this is built on, is just web APIs and just web systems as a whole. They can be chained together so, so, so easily. Uh, and that, that of course, is good, but you got to outweigh the goods with the bads and the factor of the risk. Um, these kind of web systems, uh, or these web systems are used everywhere that you can see them in user management systems, remote starts, like not, I'm saying outside of the key fob, I'm saying like inside of a third app or a third party, party application. You can see them self-driving systems. Infotainment consoles seems to be a pretty big thing. Uh, for those who don't know, your infotainment console is this little um, console up here with all the information and stuff and applications that make it unique. You can also see them in GPS systems, all these assistance systems and so on from there. Um, so regardless, you can imagine where you know hackers might want to go. <laughs> they might be fleeting towards those remarks, remote start systems and the user management side of things because they want to reverse engineer apps that make it easy to remotely hijack a vehicle. And that's the important side of things. Um, but that being said, now that we know kind of a little bit about what's attackable, why people attack it, and so on from there, how exactly do we rate or even model out what happens? Um, threat modeling and threat rating are two ways we can both model and rate threats. Modeling is actually our, which I, I kind of went through threat rating this slide, but I'll talk about modeling before I get to there. When it comes to threat modeling, we want to model out the uh, threats on a system or uh, in this case, a vehicle. And in that case, we use very specific models for that to help us understand, you know, sensors or maybe there's a specific, um, how do I say it, uh, entry point that we're not seeing, a uh, whole bunch of other things. Once we're done with actually modeling the threats and we figure out, you know, what they are and uh, we find a vulnerability or something, we want to actually rate the threat itself. I want to get off of here right off of the bat that I use a DREAD model, um, the, the threat rating model called DREAD. If you guys are not familiar with it, it, it is just that. It's a threat rating model to help us rate the impact of threats pretty much. 
on the right side, I'd like to tackle this a bit more first. Um, I have a giant, giant label called Today's Issue with Dread, and I've listed a few good points. I use the Dread model to help people understand how threat rating works on a smaller level, but I want you guys to understand that the knowledge given here is very, very minimal on this model. In fact, this model is actually pretty outdated and it's not used. I think it was abandoned by Microsoft in like 2008, and there's a lot more different models, such as the CVSS model, which I won't go into here, but it's just another model, or the 262622 um, ASIL model. There's a whole bunch of other unique models here that get into it. Uh, so just to generally give you an overview, Dread kind of points out a few things. It says, what is the damage cost? How easy is it to reproduce? How easy is it to exploit? How much is affected or how many people are affected in this case? How easy is it to discover? All of these points going one by one, I guess you guys could easily pick it together, but just to go through it, if you look at like what the damage cost is, we're trying to look at like what the overall cost of that damage is when someone hacks into it or takes advantage of that exploit. How easy is it to re reproduce gives us a good example of like saying um, if a vulnerability is easy to reproduce, then that's a big problem because that means people can actually start automating that vulnerability. Uh, for example, in SQL injection, uh, people can automate SQL injection with SQL map, and that would be an example of a vulnerability that is very, very easily reproducible, even in specific scenarios. Um, how easy is it to exploit is another factor that kind of comes into things because it tells us if someone can exploit it easily, then there is another massive problem here, and it probably should go higher on the priority list that we fix it. How much is affected is more or less a point on the like group's end or the software's end of like, if it's affected this much, or is it tailored towards specific systems, um, specific versions or software, or maybe there's a whole system that's affected and so on from there. And lastly, how easy is it to discover? The discovery aspect, this has been a, a very ongoing debate as from what I've been doing research on this model a lot, uh, even when I did try to use it before. The discoverability is basically supposed to state that if it's easier to discover, then again, it's going to be easier to automate, but it can kind of become a bit contradictive in some states from what I've heard. Um, again, I believe that that information is purely biased and is just an argument on the whole threat rating side of things and it kind of goes over. Uh, but generally speaking, how easy is it to discover can be taken as a side of saying, okay, if it's easy to discover, then it's easier to attack and so on from there. Uh, DREAD basically just stands for Damage, reproduction, exploitability, affected, how much is affected, and then the discovery aspect of things. Dread is not used for a few big reasons, and going back to kind of like that same Goldilocks principle, um, Dread is too, too simple. Th when rating threats and really trying to understand how powerful or impactful a threat is uh, on a system if it's exploited, you want a model that can actually properly identify key points and key aspects, but you don't want a model to be too simple. Dread tried and made the best attempt, especially at its time, uh, to point out some key aspects, but of course this was very small information. I mean, what does this tell us about a vulnerability other than the fact that it's easy to exploit and easy to reproduce or maybe harder to reproduce? It's, that's very minimal information. On the other hand, you have threat models that are, uh, or threat rating systems, sorry, that are much, much more complex. And then complexity throws it off the chain. And it's like, okay, now we're too complex and now we're kind of all over the place as how and where to rate these um, threats. You kind of want something like the, again, the CVSS model that's very, um, not only is constantly updated, but is also very understandable from a beginner perspective. And is even talked about a little bit more when it comes to the factor that it's like split in between, it's not too complex, but it's also not too simple. But it's just right to where you can easily go and say, okay, this threat is worth um, this amount of rating or this score. Um, but in general, just to kind of sum up what the whole purpose of the slide is, is just to just say that threat rating and the whole threat modeling aspect as well is very, very, very important. Um, especially in the vehicle sector, because you want to be able to say, okay, here's a list of vulnerabilities. Let's take care of the one that's the most like highest and what's the most important on this list based on how much is affected. In this case, again, if we're using Dread um, or other models might specify, say, you know, the issue with exploiting such a very common vulnerability, if say a bunch of script kiddies get to it and now they start messing with internal systems. <laughs> 
Um, right, so that's pretty much the end of this slide. I didn't really want to go deep into it, but just to give you a general idea of on the other specter of rating threats and understanding the systems that go into them a little bit. Now we have kind of come into a little bit of an end to the presentation. We kind of start hitting the uh, primary purpose of this presentation. So I have this title slide, Protecting Human Life, A Strand, uh, a strand of Hope. Uh, I won't go deep into it because I, I don't think I can publicly say this and I don't want to, uh, but this industry is very, very, very wacky, I will say. I won't say wrong, I won't say right, I will just say wacky because that gives me the best, uh, best way to introduce this section. Automotive cybersecurity is, is a world that's constantly growing, and it's sad to see that a lot of vehicles, despite the standards, um, which I will get into if you guys have questions about or if you guys would like to me to go deeper on that, uh, standards to protect systems and understand systems, um, even though that there are those standards, it seems that a lot of companies just do the bare minimum, and they really, really don't care about the cybersecurity aspect. If they do, then they're not doing such a good job at it. The issue with this is a factor that, again, versus uh, standard systems uh, hacking, you're instead of stealing data, you're taking someone's life. Uh, so it's, it's at this point, whether it's research into vehicles or let our future become controlled by malware in, in vehicles. And as our hospitals are already being attacked by ransomware, it's not a good future. The fact that we are still being attacked by ransomware in a government system and we seem to not even want to be able to protect against standard um, malware or other viruses and stuff that's spread on systems. This research is very, very important. And a lot of people, a lot of companies want to hide it all uh, in the same way that people just like when it comes to Apple, you know, if you reverse engineer Apple's systems, they instantly take it down. And some people, uh, for example, even in game cheating, where game companies will come after kids for exploiting their games and try to sue them and take down the research and take down the understanding, even if it's a bit annoying that game cheaters are, you know, they're, uh, the point is that a lot of companies and even groups of people just don't want the research out there because they believe that it's going to cause more harm than good if it's like uncontrolled, which is a very plausible and good reason. There's a few reasons uh, or I've listed here of like where we can go from the scratch in this industry and where I'm looking forward to. And a part of it is just making everything much more open. You notice that a common theme between points A to F are really just growing organizations, getting to the fact of uh, uh, building all these new frameworks and systems and stuff that are more open to the public. Um, of course, you don't want to tell someone how to hack a car. That's just some rando on the street, like your average Joe, because that's just, they're going to abuse it. But if you actually talk amongst security research organizations and actually pull some cool research together, and if we actually worked properly with companies, we may be able to save a lot of people. Not just people, but we may be able to save a company literally millions of uh, manufacturing money from the money that they would be uh, that would be taken out of their pockets if they get sued from so and so attacks. Um, so yeah, just kind of like in the same way that Ford ignored a, a complete Wi-Fi vulnerability in their networks and told everyone pretty much that it was it's okay and that everyone should just continue driving. <laughs> That's a good example of like just shoving something under the carpet in the same way that companies sometimes like Google does, but I will give Google the credit. At least sometimes they take ownership for some of the stuff that happens. That was just the point of this uh, slide here was just to introduce you to the fact that like this industry is a bit weird. There's a lot of people that don't really know what they're doing. There's also a lot of people that don't want to educate. And there's a lot of people that want to hide stuff, um, specific knowledge about systems. I mean, I'm even having troubles about hard, how to target very specific uh, systems. And the best I'm doing is just applying current knowledge to um, build a theory on automotive cybersecurity. Moving on, I kind of would like to end this uh, presentation because it's gone on pretty decently long enough. Um, and this page is just showing you some places where you can find me. Uh, Instagram, GitHub, LinkedIn, if you guys would like to connect. And with that, we have come to the end of the presentation.